Now we move on to chapter 8, the process of technological innovation. One of the more fascinating things about technology is that immediate and universal communications have speeded up our lives. Communication today is both immediate and personal. Mainframes that once filled rooms have become PCs. Personal computers can do the work of an entire office. The ability to process information and distribute it has changed dramatically. Research at every level has been transformed. UPC codes, which came along in the mid-70s, alter the way we keep track of things, inventory, shipping. Portable electronics started to take off in the 60s with the invention of the integrated circuit. Of course, now we can see images instantly with digital cameras, for example and the cell phone enables us to be accessible social beings. TV has changed from broadcast towers to satellite, now to the internet. Through GPS, we could know where we are and uh, where our children are, or our cars, or other people. The inside of our bodies used to be a mystery. Now we can look inside through medical imaging, such as ultrasound, MRIs and so forth can affect the way we think of ourselves. We are moving into a post-information age where DNA sequencing helps us understand our bodies even more. Laparoscopic surgery using fiber optics reduces trauma and invasive surgeries. Send a camera and a surgical device in instead of cutting the body open. Lightweight and smart materials from carbon fibers such as Kevlar offer protection and a cleaner environment. And of course, we have lasers. As I said a minute ago, we live in an information age that Weinstein suggests may be changing into something else. It isn't just that we've lived one technological revolution among many. It's that our technological revolution is the big social revolution that, li that we live with. In the last 20 years, for example, our, I don't think our morals have changed, but the ability to say nasty things, or four-letter words, has changed. 20 years ago, you could use the F word on HBO, but not uh, ABC. Now you can tweet it or instant message it. What does this have to do with anything? Well... Technology has played a critical role in the evolutionary process, if you'd like to follow along, by the way, at this point, with the handout, in terms of how we adapt to our environments. It has allowed us to destroy entire species and the ability to either kill ourselves or feed everybody. So what's the point? Technology by itself has no effect. The social con consequences of technology is the technology people have chosen to use in particular ways. That, of course, is one way to look at it. Another is to recognize that we're replacing human labor with machines in all, and I emphasize all, areas of our lives. This, in turn, has caused unintended stresses and strains. Weinstein talks about the technological imperative on page 201 which essentially requires that more and more innovations, computers, need software. I apologize, that didn't make sense. Weinstein talks about the technological imperative, which requires more and more innovations to keep the system running. Computers need software, etc. And we have reverse adaptation, which gives prestige to individuals with technological expertise that can keep the whole thing running. Our new technologies have had serious impacts on the environment. Technology also causes insecurity. Weinstein notes that technological society is filled with nervous people worried about the prospect that they will be bypassed by progress. Finally, whether it's the internet, a government database, or a media conglomerate, power has become centralized into the hands of the few. One person can bring down a network, for example. Centralization, of course, by itself is not bad, as it has enormous advantages in organizing and mobilizing, say in the face of an emergency. But, as we've seen recently with Homeland Security, 
individual rights are affected. Superorganic technologies, that is the know-how to change people's beliefs, actions, or attitudes, contribute to power being controlled by just a few individuals or an elite. The medical community, for example, has been telling us since the 1950s that we are better off with a fee-for-service system. Propaganda, political indoctrination, the use of secret police, or state terror were refined after World War II in communist states, particularly where all forms of media were state-controlled. It's interesting to note that in a situation like North Korea, if you don't know anything other than what your government has been telling you, there is no impetus to change. Because of this, the way things are, are always the way they are. For example, in North Korea, the war, the Korean War, was caused by America invading North Korea. Well, as usual, it appears that I have messed up with my, um, excuse me, with uh, keeping the handout and my lecture together. Sorry about that. Anyway, we're done with Chapter 8, and I would like now to refer you to, to Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat. Start the video at approximately the third minute in, and you can hear him talk about the great levelers. When someone in another country has access to the same information and resources that you and I do, when that someone does not have to build the infrastructure you have built to be successful, then you've gone from vertical to horizontal, you are no longer at the top.